Hello class, welcome to the next segment in lecture 8, and in this segment we're going to start looking at some of the physical consequences that arise from the mass continuity equation, and that's also what the next segment is going to be devoted to, but on this particular segment I wanted to focus on this whole idea of mass flux, or just flux of anything in general. So with that, let's go ahead and dive right into it. So we left off with deriving this lovely equation after a whole bunch of math which uh, hopefully you are not all mathed out. So it's, uh, not a whole lot of math is going to be taken, taking place from here on out, but there is going to be a little bit, just fair warning. This is going to be a very math-heavy lecture. But I do want to, again, take a closer look at this idea of mass flux, which is what this term basically represents. It's the, the exact phrasing I used was I call this the divergence of mass flux, but hopefully this will make a little bit more sense once we actually uh, start to explain and elaborate what exactly that means. So for any physical parameter at all, whether it's mass or whatever it might be, the flux of that physical parameter is defined as how much of that parameter you have. So Q can be any physical value at all. In this case, we're looking at mass. So it's that physical parameter Q divided by the area through which it's flowing, also divided by time. So it's Put in the most broad sense of terms, it is the rate at which something is flowing through a specific area per unit time. That may not make a whole lot of sense right now, but fortunately I have some illustrations that will hopefully help make help elaborate what exactly is going on here. But I just want to introduce the idea of a flux. It's the flow of something through some unit area per unit time. And there's more examples of this than just mass flux. One very common quantity that you might be working with, especially if you take uh, an electricity and magnetism class, is magnetic flux, which, uh, in which case this capital B here represents the magnetic field lines. And again, same thing, we have the, the magnetic field divided by area times time. And you can also have electric flux, which, if I remember my physics correctly, is something that comes up when you apply Gauss's law to a charge distribution. And that, all, that whole idea stems from the idea of electric flux, which is the electric field lines divided by unit area per unit time. But as we've seen before, we can also have mass flux, where in this case our physical parameter is m, and that's divided by area times time. Now you might be wondering, hold on a second, that does not look anything like what we have up here. Let me come back to this later on in the segment, and you'll see that this m divided by area times time, this does in fact turn out to be equal to this term that we have over here, this rho times v. But before I do that, I do want to cover this idea of flux in a little bit more of detail. So remember, the flux is the rate at which a physical parameter is flowing through some unit area. So here I'm just going to use this as sort of a baseline. So we have six, areas rep six arrows representing some physical parameter that can be anything at all, anything that can flow, and then the area is given by this uh, blue parallelogram here. Now, I can increase the flux by adding more of the physical parameters. So here I have six arrows, meaning I have uh, six arrows worth of Q, any physical parameter. And over here on the right-hand side, I have 12 arrows. So since I have more of my physical quantity, in this case, I might have more mass flowing through the same unit area at the same rate of speed. Since I have more stuff flowing through that same area and same uh, at the same speed, then I must have more flux. And this diagram illustrates how increasing the amount of Q, the amount of physical stuff that I have flowing, by increasing that amount, I increase the flux. And similarly, I can decrease the flux by decreasing the amount of stuff that I have flowing through the area per unit time. So same speed, same area, just less stuff. Less stuff flowing through the same area at this, in the same amount of time means less flux. So let's take a look at another way that we can influence the flux. Another way we can influence the flux is to increase the rate at which our stuff is flowing. If our stuff is flowing faster, it takes less time to traverse this little area element that we have right here. So if it takes less time to traverse that area element, that means this t in the denominator must be smaller. So if my stuff is moving faster, this actually increases flux by increasing the amount of stuff and by decreasing the amount of time. So by making this stuff move faster, I decrease this time term in the denominator, and therefore I increase the flux. So if my stuff is moving faster, I'm increasing the flux. If I move it slower, it will decrease the flux. And then finally, we'll take a look at how the area, this area term, can influence the amount of flux. So if I decrease the amount of area, you'll see that the arrows get packed much tighter together. Typically, when you have arrows that are tighter together, that means more flux. But if you have 
more arrows and also more area, those two effects might cancel out. But in this case, since I have the same number of arrows flowing through uh, different areas, so in this case, on the left-hand side, I have six arrows flowing through a large area versus on the right-hand side here, where I have six arrows flowing through a smaller area. Since the amount of stuff is the same, since the velocity is the same, the area is the only difference. Since I have more area on the left-hand side, I have less flux, or excuse, yeah, I have less flux. And then since I have less area on the right-hand diagram, I have more flux. Since the flux is inversely proportional to area, less area generally means more flux. And if I take that into the other end, or in the other direction, so here I have a small area, here I have a large area with the same number of arrows. Since I've increased the area here, you notice the areas get spaced a little bit farther apart in this diagram, but since I have increased the area here, same number of arrows, same velocity, or same amount of time to traverse that area, since I increase the area, I decrease the amount of flux that's present. So flux, that's just sort of a, that's just sort of an illustration that will hopefully give you a better idea of what exactly we mean by flux when we mean a rate, uh, uh, the rate at which some physical quantity flows through some specific or some area element. So that's the whole idea. That's what we mean by flux. It's how much stuff you've got flowing through some area per unit time. All right, so back to this. Now I'll go ahead and verify that this mass over area times time is in fact equal to this rho times uh, velocity here. So again, we can use the same uh, density law that we used in the first segment where we can rewrite the equation for density to read as follows. Mass is equal to density times volume. So we just simply take this expression for m and plug it into the numerator up here. So we get this, rho times volume over area times time. But we can also express volume as an area times a height or some sort of distance. So that's a little bit of a geometry of you. The volume is defined as the area of your base times the height of your figure. So that's using that idea, we can write volume as area times x. I could use any symbol at all, but here I'll just use x for the sake of simplicity. And if I take that expression for v and plug it into this equation up here, we get rho times area times x over area times time. And you'll notice the areas cancel. So I'm left with rho times x over time. If I have distance over time, then I in fact have velocity. So I get rho v. So that's just to verify that this mass over area times time, this mass flux, by the very fundamental definition of mass flux, this does in fact verify that mass over area times time is in fact equal to density times velocity, which is what we have in the parentheses of this expression up here. So that's going to do it for this segment. And in the next segment, we're just going to continue the idea of exploring some of the additional physical consequences that arise from the mass continuity equation. So hopefully, the idea of flux made a little bit of sense. So with that, I will see you all in the next segment.